Hey, my name's Jerry Brust. Uh, I'm the IPM vegetable specialist at the University of Maryland. Uh, I used to be here on the eastern shore, but uh, they've moved me over to the western shore. So I'm in uh, PG County now, it's just outside Washington, D.C., where I do most of my research. And I've been working on different ways of producing uh, vegetables without tillage. And some ways have been kind of successful, and others have been um, um, failures. Okay, just well, real quick. Uh, weeds, any uh, plant non-intentionally sown or propagated by a grower, blah, blah, blah. Plants that grow where they're not wanted is the, basically the bottom line. So it's any plant that's growing where you don't want it. That could be a cover crop that you started to grow and wanted it as a cover crop, and you've tilled or done whatever, and now it's become a weed in your plot. Okay, I got this, some of this off the uh, internet. Uh, weeds are the most costly category of agricultural pests worldwide. Weeds cause more yield loss and add more to farmers' production costs than insects, crop diseases, nematodes, or warm-blooded pests. That'd be deer and rodents and things like that. So weeds are uh, a real pain. And I remember uh, doing a field day at a grower's farm. And at the end of it all, there, there are four or five uh, organic growers there and uh, four or five university people there. And we asked them, what, what would you like us to work on? What help do you need the most in? And they thought about it for a little while. And they came up with weeds. Weeds were their number one problem. But the thing that they wanted more than anything was a chemical that controlled the weeds that was organic. And once they sprayed it, it controlled it, and they didn't have to worry about it again. So that, that ain't going to happen. I can tell you that right now. That's, that's never going to happen. Not going to happen with synthetic systems either. So, in so synthetic systems, we use uh, chemicals to reduce weed losses. So what are some methods we can use in organic systems? And oh, some of the rolling cripping, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Cover crop and planting into the killed mulch. And I'm also gonna talk about using tillage or strip tillage, planting to bare soil, either in a wide swath or a very narrow strip. And then tillage using plastic mulch. How many people use plastic mulch in their operation? Okay. For all your vegetables or uh, just certain ones? On small scale, it would have been tomato culture on steak tomatoes. Right. That's what most people use it for, tomatoes or peppers or something like that. Uh, the rest of it, you, you don't use plastic at all. Okay. A little bit. A little bit. That's fine. That's fine. So, uh, synthetic Grower, uh, vegetable growers use plastic a lot, and they use tillage a lot, and then they use a lot of uh, chemicals a lot. Okay, the central goal of weed management is to reduce the weed competition. If you can just reduce the weed competition with the main crop, then you can stand more weeds. And most of the time when, I don't know if it's farmer pride or what it is, uh, growers don't like to see any weeds out in their farm. So it's either a real clean tillage, or it seems to be it got away from them and it's, it's a weedy mess. It seems to be one or the other. But you can have something in between where you have some weeds, but the, the weed competition that they present to the crop is very minimal. And the other thing you want to do, and that's why you can't let any weeds go to seeds. You just can't. You're just going to produce more weed seeds, which adds to that weed seed bank. And that weed seed bank already is limitless, just about. It is extremely difficult to reduce the weed seed bank in most soils. Those, you don't see the weed seeds, but they're there. I used to do a lot of work way back when I did my PhD down in North Carolina. And one of the things I did was just collect soil. And a nice tilled soil, you wouldn't think they had any weed seeds. And then we just grow out and see what comes up. And you wouldn't believe the amount of weeds that come up in a disturbed soil system. And the, these are from farm systems that use herbicides, you know, continuously, and they still had a huge weed seed bank. So, and I see this, the reason I bring this up, because I see this when I go out to organic farms a lot, things get away from them and they just don't have the uh, manpower to continue the labor to continue uh, reducing their weed population. So they sort of let it go 
and then the uh, weeds go to seed, and then they produce those seeds, and they're there for the next 10 years, sometimes even more. So it's real important to stop that weed seed production. Okay, integrated weed management is what we're looking at. And again, it's not one of these things, you've heard it of integrated pest management, but we usually don't think of integrating weed management. Weed management, we usually think of just getting rid of the weeds, just eliminate them completely, either with chemicals or with tillage. But there's something in between. And, uh, you can use cultural, physical, chemical, and biological uh, management systems. We're going to talk about cultural and more physical today, but not anything about chemical or biological. These two, uh, uh, you can't use really, not much chemical you can use in organic systems. There's some burn down chemicals you can use. Biologicals, these were big at one time. I remember 20 years ago, they were all excited about certain diseases that they found on certain weeds. And you spray it out there on the field and it attacks those weeds. It would kill some of them, but mostly it just made them sick and made the weeds not grow very well. So that, that was the competition, it lessened the competition. The problem was it was kind of expensive. You had to have the right environmental conditions for it to work. And it only worked on that one weed species. So if there was another weed family you were trying to combat, uh, this, the diseases wouldn't help very much. So after about four or five years of really trying to push that, uh, it just sort of fell apart. Nobody was interested in buying those diseases anymore for those certain weed species. Crop rotation. Uh, we look at crop rotation, uh, especially for insects or disease, but it also can be used uh, for weed control. And you alternate a grass with a dicot uh, because the weeds that grow with the grass are going to be different than the ones that grow with the dicot at first or a little later on. At first, the first flush, those weeds are going to be about the same, whether it's a grass or a dicot, but then after time, it's going to be a little bit different. And so you can apply different techniques to control uh, different weeds. And if you go back and forth between a grass for a couple of years and a dicot for a couple of years, you're going to have different weed species come up. Uh, crop cycles, whether you go early one year uh, with crucifers or late one year, uh, let's say with tomato, a late tomato crop, that's going to affect the weeds that come up. Uh, I think most of you know this, you don't want to plant the same family of crops in the same field year after year. I think most of you realize that. And avoid crops with weed, like weed management practices. So if you do the same thing, year after year and you just use tillage and you knock tillage uh, and the tillage knocks the weeds back and you do that year after year you're going to favor certain weeds that can handle that tillage and those weeds are going to be very difficult to control over time if that's your only weed management practice all right the one almost everybody relies on and our our farm relies on it a lot is tillage and whether you use a great big machine like this, or a little machine, or you use animal, or if you use human power, it's all the same. You're trying to eliminate that weed completely from a field. And if you look at a field like this, you know, that's pretty impressive. People like to see that nice green crop out there, and there's no weeds. I think it's a matter of pride sometimes that we have this uh, clean crop mentality. So tillage is the number one thing, but tillage has a lot of problems. One is the maintenance and cost of the equipment, and if you're using just human power, the time that is involved. And we'll look a little bit uh, at the time that's involved in controlling weeds in different uh, production systems. Uh, fossil fuel or human power. One of the things that growers, organic growers have talked to me about is when they till you're going to lose soil carbon. And soil carbon is the same as soil organic matter. So anytime you use any kind of cultivation or tillage, you are going to burn up that soil organic matter. That's because you're mixing oxygen. Once you mix oxygen and a little bit of food and a little bit of moisture, it's all the microbes need. And so they're going to feed off that organic matter and they're going to use it up and then they're going to die. And then hopefully they're, they're going to be recycled, uh, at least the nutrients will be. But you're going to still lose that soil carbon. 
over time with each tillage or cultivation. Soil erosion, new weed flushes. This is a big one we're going to talk about, about is avoiding weed flushes. That's one of the keys in uh, using uh, no-till uh, weed control. And soil integrity. When you mix that soil up all the time, you're not going to have those nice layers of soil that develop with earthworms going up and down and creating channels in that soil. And you want those channels so that the nutrients can move up and down and the water can move down into the roots and doesn't hit the soil, fuse the top layer of the soil, and then just runs off. Okay. I don't know why it does that. All right, the uh, National uh, Resource Conservation Service, it, they want you to limit tillage for that reason, uh, soil disruption, and then it burns carbon off. And so they're looking at people using more no-till and strip-till. And that has been fairly common in uh, the row crops like corn and soybean, where they've used no-till, sometimes strip-till, but not so much in vegetables. When I usually show this slide, I'm usually talking about uh, how we can use uh, cover crops as nitrogen sources. And what I'm looking at when I'm talking about cover crops as nitrogen sources is down around this area, where a 15 to 1 uh, C to N ratio, up to 20 to 1, 22 to 1, something like that. And what that does, it, it breaks down, the material breaks down fairly rapidly. It releases nitrogen. It's not tied up. It will release nitrogen at this level. But if you get down to this level, the nitrogen release is so rapid uh, that you can often, after about two or three weeks, the nitrogen is almost gone from that cover crop. So that would be something that's a pure cover crop like clovers or vetch. So you want to get it up here so it's a little bit slower. So what we're going to do for no-till, we want something that's going to last a little bit longer on top of the soil. So we're looking at C to N ratio. We're trying to manage it's somewhere around 25 to 30 to 32. We don't want to get too far up, although sometimes we do. We get up to 40 to 1, and that material is just going to sit there, and it's going to use up some of the nitrogen you have in your soil because there's just not enough nitrogen in the cover crop system for the microbes to use. And so they're going to have to borrow some from your soil. So we want to try to avoid that. We don't want to put stress on your crop uh, by stealing nitrogen from the soil. OK. So we're 20 to 40, somewhere in there. I'd like to stay around uh, between 20 and 30. Uh, anything above 40, you're going to have a real tie up of uh, any kind of end. So we have to be careful about what type of cover crops we might use in our no-till system. Okay. Again, this is uh, more for when would you uh, terminate a cover crop to get the most nitrogen from it. You want to take a picture of that? Yes. And as you can see, this is for cereal. Cereal you, you want to do pretty early on if you want nitrogen from that cereal. The longer you wait for cereal, the more that nitrogen ratio, that the plant available nitrogen is going to go down for that particular cover crop. And this is any kind of cereal, wheat or uh, rye. It's just it's going to get tougher and tougher as it gets uh, older and older. So once it gets up joint and boot and starts to form a head, uh, the amount of nitrogen is going to get back is very little, if any, that first year. Even a legume, even a field that's only 25% legumes, other parts grass, it's going to uh, give off nitrogen for a little while, and then it's going to go down. It's only when you get up to about 50%, 75%, that you're going to give off a lot of nitrogen. So again, for our purposes, we're going to go a little bit later with, with uh, destroying that uh, uh, cereal, that grass. So we're going to be more in this range. And then for this, we're going to be more up here in this range. So we're going to be up in this range when we try to lay that crop down as a cover crop, as an actual mulch in that soil. We're going to try to be a little bit later than we normally would for that legume. Okay. Does anybody recognize what this is? 
Go ahead. Roller right. And have you used one or? I've seen. I've never personally used one. Okay. I said they do a good job, we just got to be hit at the right, right time. time. Right, that's one of the keys. And you see it's, it's based on a roller, and they weld these strips onto it. And actually somebody did research on this a long time ago to what angle these things should be at and should be welded to on this roller. And so what this does, let's see. Okay, one of the things I found, as this gentleman said, is timing is very important in this. So for rye, the seed head should be in the early dough stage. So that means you need a seed head. Seed head. Normally we want to plow down this rye grass before it gets to the seed head if we're using that cover crop for nitrogen source, or trying to. But for, for using it as a mulch, we want to wait a little bit longer before we crimp and roll this. And the same thing, in this case, the hairy vetch. Or it could be uh, crimson clover or most of the others. You want to have uh, late flowering with a little uh, seed pods just beginning to form. So if you grab those seed pods and you rub your finger over it, you're going to feel the development of the seeds. They're not completely developed yet, but you feel that they're developing. But the rest of the pod is empty. So you only have about two or three seeds in that pod, and the rest of it's empty. You don't want to go wait until that entire pod is filled, even though most of them are immature. There will be some mature seed still that has developed in that pod. So you want to destroy it before then. Probably, uh, if you use hairy vetch, hairy vetch very hard seed. So 10, 15% of it does not germinate that first year. It'll germinate the next year, and germinate the next year. So you don't want to add any more seeds to that. So this is my system that I've been using uh, for many years. And what I do, I go across the field like this, across the field. Each one of my strips is 30 feet long, 30 feet wide. So 30 feet wide of rye. And then next to it, 30 feet wide of hairy vetch. And then next to that is uh, 30 feet of hairy vetch and rye combination. <coughs> and then I have another row, which I try different things with. Um, right now, uh, I'm into the combination of four or five different cover crops to see how that works. I started off with just using it as a weed plot. Didn't put down any cover crop, just bare soil. Tilled it like everything else, and then planted my cover crops. In that one row, I did not have a cover crop, just let weeds come up. And then a couple of years later, I started using tillage radish. Okay. <coughs> one thing you can't Tillage radish, if it dies, is great. If it doesn't die, then you have to till it up uh, the next year. It should winter kill. But a lot of times, in our winters just aren't harsh enough, and it won't winter kill. But tillage radish is nice if you're looking to go early in the season. And that's one of the things I was looking at, was going early in the season, uh, planting uh, crucifers and cabbage and broccoli and things like that. So I didn't want to use this type of system because I need a lot more growth on this, and it's going to be too late in the year. And that's one of the things about uh, no-till. It's not something I'd recommend on a, a seasonal basis or a yearly basis uh, for your whole farm. Oh, you have a question? So the tillage vetch before the early brassicas is great timing-wise, but not family-wise. It's the same family. Yes, the same so family. Uh, but one of the things I looked at was, uh, is there a problem having tilled radish and then going crucifers the next year? I have not seen any. What you want to do is make sure you look at the tillage radish and there's nothing in it. Now sometimes you'll get maggots and things like that. They'll start to attack the tillage radish. If it's clean, it's okay to Yes, if it's clean, I have not seen any disease or uh, weed, not weed, or insect problems with the tillage radish. And I think the reason for that is it may start out that way, but it dies in the winter. Things just aren't, usually aren't carried over for that one or two seasons. I would not go three or four years in a row with it. But two, two seasons, that's the most I've done. I, I have not run into any problems. And it's one of the things I looked at for. So I want this to get up to a certain age. And you see the seed heads are forming here. 
And this will get up a certain age. You can see it's just starting to flower. You need that to flower a little more. And this has been the biggest problem with uh, doing no tillage, is that the freaking cover crops don't cooperate with you. And so sometimes they're, they're very early, but most of the times they're kind of late and they're kind of lagging behind. And one of the problems is my fault, is I don't get that cover crop out early enough. And I need to get out in August. Okay. Where are you? I'm in Prince George's County. And end of August, early September, but I consistently are fooling around with other plots. And so I don't get it out till October. And so I just don't get enough growth early on in that fall to have it next year start to take off and go like crazy. So the few times I have been able to do it in August, then this works much better. It comes on much earlier, puts on growth much earlier, and I'm able to till it down sometime in May, early May, even late April, and it gets to this point. Okay. Now, these are my plots, and the strips are going across like this. So they're all going across, and then I till or crimp and roll going the opposite 90 degree angle, okay? So here I'm, compared, I'm going to compare this crimp and roll with a tillage system. And this, the one on your right, the strip on your right, was uh, crimped and rolled a week earlier than the one on your left. And so just a week difference, and it's starting to re regrow very well. I was a little too early in that crimping. And so if you're a little too early in the crimping, this is what happens. You lay it flat, but it comes back. If you're timed right and you lay it flat, and what it does, the crimper, is, let's say this is a stalk of uh, rye, those, those little strips you saw on the, the roller, they crimp it, and then they crimp it again, and they crimp it again. And so the, the thing, the stalk is crimped in about five or six different places. And so what that does, especially if it's dry, that's another thing, if it's dry, uh, and dry means you don't get an inch of rain about a day or two after you crimped it. Then the, it's, it's, it's been broken open in these four or five spots. And so it slowly starts to dry out. If we get a bunch of rain right after you crimp it, then it's able to heal itself and, and come back a bit more. So you can see that uh, the no-till system is, is really uh, at the mercy of the environment. Let's see anything else here. So timing is important about when you do the rolling crimping. So if it rained unexpectedly after you crimped it, could you come back a few days later? Oh, thank you for that. That's one of the thing, other thing I experimented with was what happens if we crimp this twice or three times uh, will it help. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Once you've crimped it, it doesn't help. It doesn't matter if you crimp it five times, you are not going to get any more kill. It doesn't increase it. And what it does is actually is bigger pain in the butt because if it, and what happens is we had that, we had a rain that came, and so we decided to crimp it again and then crimp it again. And because the soil was wet and we were rolling over it, and you have to have a heavy uh, crimper roller in order to really push down on the, uh, uh, the stalks, uh, I had compaction problems. But if you waited until your soil was dry, because you don't want to go on the wet soil anyway. Right. If you wait till it's dry, it's too late. It's too late. I, I have not had any success with rolling or crimping it, because it never stands up again straight. It always does this. And then it grows, and then it doesn't, it, it doesn't actually grow, it just doesn't die. Right. So it just stays like that, and it stays kind of green, and it's just sort of in between. It's not going to decay, which is what you want it to. It just sort of hangs on. And crimping it at that point just didn't seem to really help much. Okay. So you get one chance of crimping. You, you might want to use two, uh, but I found one, one chance of crimping, and that's about it. Sometimes if it's real heavy, uh, you can get a real good crimp. This is a real good crimp right here, crimp and roll. Uh, this stuff is laid down really nicely and it's gonna form a, a nice uh, barrier to the weeds. 
once it starts to dry out and dies. This has just been crimped, so th those flowers will dry. So you can see the stage that I'm at here. This is flowering. The seed pods are just forming. This had seed heads on it, the rye. And again, I'm comparing uh, a crimped area with a tilled area. And I actually have plastic over there on the far side to compare each of the three type of systems and what kind of vegetables I'm going to get out of them. And I grow the same variety of tomatoes and plant them hopefully the same day. Now sometimes you can get a real good crimp and roll. You just don't have enough material. And this happens sometimes if your rye cover crop isn't real good. And the, the white flower you see is a weed coming through. And so that weed's already starting to come through, come through and it's already early in the year. So this, this is a failure right here. I would not plant into this at all if you got weeds coming up this soon. So at that point, what would you do with that? Till it in? I would till it up and go from there. And then other times you get this, and this is what I take lots of pictures of when I get this, and I show everybody this is how, well, how you do no tillage, and this is how it works. Uh, but <clears throat> I do show them the bad pictures too, because you have to, because you really have to want to do this to get into it. Uh, it's going to take work and management in order to get this to work. How many days after crimping is that? This, this is probably about a week, 10 days after crimping. So I started off uh, crimping, rolling, and I decided to use uh, sweet corn as my vegetable, just because it's fairly easy to use. Uh, it, corn seems to be able to take a, a no-till situation better than most other crops. But I want to experiment. This is about uh, five, six years ago I started with this. But already you can see, th this is just beautiful. This is exactly what you want, and this is what it should look like when you crimp and roll. This is uh, probably about two weeks after I crimped and rolled this area. But you can see I'm already getting weeds <coughs> in these back areas back here starting to come up, but not in the front areas. What I found, let me see if I have a picture of this, the next one. Yeah, see the, uh, the, what the cover crop was on the left-hand side here? This was the vetch, the vetch and rye right here, and this was just the rye. And most people think if you have rye and a good stand of rye, which is just a good stand of rye, that the rye is going to be the, the best type of cover, and it's not. And what I see happening when you lay the rye down is that they seem to go, if, if my fingers are the rye, they seem to go parallel with each other. And so in between those places where you have the rye stalks, that's where the weeds come up. And so they come up in between that. Okay? But when you have something else in there, in between those rye stalks, and in this case it's hairy vetch, it can act like a snake and get in between those stalks. Then it seals it up and you get this kind of ground cover right here. And you see how much better the corn looks here than it does back here. You can hardly see it because of the weeds. And then you see it starting it up again in the back. Okay, some years like this one, and you see how bad the weeds are here. And the corn is yellow back here. The weeds, the grass are stealing the nitrogen from it. Uh, <clears throat> my yields were cut by 40% in the sweet corn. And so you can see even up here where it's decent, where I had a decent uh, cover crop, I still had weeds take off on me, mostly grasses. I have mostly a grass problem. And if you have a lot of rain in June and then some in July, it's going to be much more difficult to do the no-till. Okay, a lot of rain is difficult to stop the grasses. They will come up through the no-till. And so I, I needed some, some other way to work with uh, this, this problem. And this is a, a bad e year. Uh, notice my base is 8,000 years per acre. And you see that when I had just weeds, I had a very very low uh, harvest, but the, the hairy vetch and the rye, very high harvest. This isn't just a weed problem, of course. 
This is also a nutrient problem. The rye is just not giving enough nutrients. So then I started using uh, poultry manure in some of the rows to help uh, the corn uh, with, uh, that had a rye cover crop, help it with nitrogen. Uh, the problem with that, anytime you feed your uh, crop, what else are you going to feed? Weeds. Right, you feed the weeds. And so you want to try to limit that. In the good old days, I could, uh, good old days being about two years ago, uh, I could put my new manure down at the beginning of the season and then plant my crop. You're not going to be able to do that anymore. You're going to have to put on your manure way early on, season before, in order to get the 180 days that you need between the manure application and the uh, harvest, no matter what the crop is. So that's what's going to happen. All right. Question. Yes. Delaware, so Maryland walls. What's the 180-day thing? It's 180 days. 180 days. You have to apply manure 180 days before you harvest anything from that, Is that field. Is that or organic? Or organic Is it 90, 120? No, it's going to be 180. That's what it's going to, the regulations are going to go to. Even for an aerial harvest of crop? I, always, I remember hearing rules on manure, but that was usually like a root or a ground harvest. Right, right. Now they're changing it to any crop. So in other words, you're going to put a product on that you're supposed to plant. When are they changing it? Pardon? 91 slash 120 for a crop that touches the ground versus a crop that does not touch the ground. Not you're saying it's going to change to 180 for both of them, no matter what it is. And yes. When? I don't know when. Oh. Whenever, whenever they get through with all their... No, yeah, I'm just not, saying yeah. my point being is I know when we do our field corn over home, we want it put on, and I know we're talking field corn versus sweet corn, but... I know. Sorry. You want it on, you know, within a week, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks before you plant. Right. And doing something like that, if you plan on using the nitrogen for that, you're only getting 10, 15 percent right. of what you applied originally. I mean, I'm not trying to get you off subject, but it just doesn't. Oh, I, I know. It's, it's crazy. I, I don't see how, how organic people are going to do it. And that, that was one of the. One of the Big complaints they came up to me about when I give talks, especially about nitrogen. I was just curious. That's, that's just for an organic system, not a conventional system. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. It's, but the poultry litter, just as the guy was talking earlier with Coleman using the litter on your crops, or some of the fellas, if you do it six months ahead of time, you've lost most of the nitrogen. Right. And that's your benefit from the litter. Right. Or if you apply <laughs> it in, in the winter, and the microbes aren't going to be active. Right. So that stuff's just going to sit there, and any time you got any kind of movement on it, you're going to lose it anyway. Thank you. So it's not my idea. I, but that's why I'm saying the good old days is when you can put it down about two months early and, and then harvest something like tomatoes. So, Okay, this is my better uh, yield uh, ears per acre. And you can see hairy vetch and the rye. Uh, still high and the hairy vetch. That's both weed and um, nutrient combination there. Okay, so if I'm looking at tomatoes, then, and I started looking at this system, okay, how am I gonna switch to tomatoes and, and have, I want this, this is what I want it to look like, but unfortunately it's gonna probably look like this at times. So what, what am I gonna do about that? You know how much time and effort it takes to go out and try to weed something like this or try to till, till something like that or cultivate, you just can't do it. Otherwise, what you do, you tear up everything that you have down, laying down here like this and you just generate more weeds. So it's, it was a conundrum. What, what exactly do I want to do? One thing I did, which was stupid, was I laid this irrigation line down between the two rows and all I did was feed the freaking weeds right here and not so much my crop. So if you're gonna irrigate, make sure that irrigation line, you either have plastic covering it or it's up against your crop. So let the water can go directly to your crop and not feed the freaking weeds, which I have problems. with. Okay, this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is my tomatoes. This is about uh, two years after I started uh, the, the tillage system. And this has been crimped. And you can see some of the crimping the cover crop right there, it's still there, but we had a lot of rain in June, 
And so the, the, the grass just came on. So you see one row over here, tomatoes. This is, OK, this is my weed plot going across here. This, so you see the weeds right here. And then you start to see hairy vetch, and then you start to see grass, I mean uh, the rye. And you see the rye sticking up there. And then it repeats itself in the back. So I have four reps of this. So the reason these tomatoes look real good here, because I fed them poultry manure. Okay. These had poultry manure. This row did not have poultry manure. And so <clears throat> there's just not enough nitrogen to feed these tomatoes when you got this much grass without the poultry manure. All right, so that's, that's one thing I want you to look at. The other thing is, when I saw this, and this is the weedy plot, I thought, well, I'll just let it go. I will, I'll harvest nothing from this row, and I'll harvest some things from this row. But I thought, why don't I try this uh, other method I'm thinking about and see how well it works. OK, this other method is using a weed cover. And so this is not the same plot. This is a different plot. I cleverly did not take any pictures when I used it for the other plot. But this is the same principle. I lay this weed cover on the weeds, right on top of them. Don't do anything else. I pin it down with these pins. And you can use any pin you want. And then I just let it sit. But uh, most people think you need, need to let it sit for a month. Or so. I let it sit for two weeks. And that was it, just two weeks. Usually it just takes one week. And then you pull it back, and this is what you see. Okay, that grass has been killed, and now it becomes a cover. And then when I, for my system, what worked well, this is two weeks under the cover. This is what you get. I simply pulled up the pins, went along, pulled up the pins, grabbed the one end of it, and I just scooted it down until it reached the end. So here was the beginning of it. So I scooted it down. So well, that was the beginning of it, and that's the end of it up there. And I let it sit there for two weeks, and then do the same thing. We were down two weeks. And so this is what I end up with, a nice little cover. And you can see what the grasses were like before. Tomatoes look pretty good at that stage. This is four weeks after I removed the cover. Very little weed germination in this area. And I think it's because we created a stale seed bed underneath that mulch. So underneath the mulch, we've had weeds germinate because they came up through, all the grass came up through. So those weeds that were going to be at the top of the soil on there, and they're going to germinate one way or another if they get a chance, they have been killed. The soil has not been disturbed. I didn't need to till it, didn't need to cultivate it. So I didn't mix up new seed to bring it to the surface. Simply put that, the cover down, let it sit for two weeks, and then moved it. How did you apply the chicken manure? <laughs> I have a, a little spreader. You just went over to surface applied in the row, basically? Surface applied, and then we tilled that in. Oh, so you tilled actually that row where the tomatoes are? Yes. Okay. So. This creates a stale seed bed, and you have very little germination. Uh, this will look very similar in eight weeks. I'll show you some pictures a little later on. So this is a system, and I looked at other things. I looked at this cover right here. This is my, my favorite one. I looked at paper. This is a paper one. Uh, the paper works all right. You just can't step on it, so it's a pain. So the, my workers needed to go out in the field and do things like putting in stakes, and then tying the tomatoes, and then suckering the tomatoes, and things like that. Uh, this just didn't work. It was too uneven, and it started to rip and tear. But this fabric is sort of a, it's a polypropylene spun fabric. It allows water to go through, so it's not plastic. So the water can penetrate it, but <coughs> light can't. And it's strong. You can walk on it. This is, uh, I've been using this for some of the same strips that I have. It comes in different lengths and different widths uh, for five years. And I'm still using some of them. The ones I'm not using are the ones I sort of destroyed with a lawnmower, going too close to them and clipping them and sucking it up. And, and it was a mess. Uh, these are the clips I use. 
People sometimes use those staples too. I don't like the staples as much. These are easier to push into the ground. Uh, they're easier to pull out with a little ring. You just put your finger on it and pull it. Uh, they stick real well. And once you push them into the ground, they are not coming out until you pull on them. So they do a good job of keeping the material plastered. And so in this case, I was using plastic mulch to see how it worked with plastic mulch. Yeah, and so this is two days after the berries were moved down the path. <laughs> and uh, you can see the grass that had germinated. I probably put this on a little bit too early, and that's, that's one of the things. I, you want some germination of the weeds first. That's what you want, and then cover it up. But you can't always do that. So if I had a choice, I'm putting this down early and then moving it down before this grass, way down here at the end of the plot, gets up this high. So I want to keep this grass low as best I can. And you see it's right, right to the edge. Very, very clean, looks very nice. And this is four weeks after I moved those barriers. And you see some weeds germinating here, again, grasses. And this is eight weeks after I moved the barriers. And you see how big the uh, tomatoes are. And you see where the, the weeds are located here? If we go back, you see this disturbance right here and the movement of the soil and over here. That's where the weeds are going to be because that soil was disturbed that little bit. So you're going to try not to disturb the soil. The other thing that's feeding this is I have drip irrigation underneath here. And so this area becomes saturated with water and it starts to leak out a little bit. And so that grasses are very good at grabbing that water and grabbing those nutrients. Again, this is the barrier as it's moved. And this type of situation, I'll have four weeks of a pretty good uh, weed reduction area. Let's call it weed reduction area. Then after about four weeks, the weeds, grasses, maybe some broad leaves that you have problems with will start to come on. And then you'll have to go in and till it or cover it up again. That's your decision. I usually uh, do a little bit tillage uh, cultivation now. All right, this is a little other thing I was experimenting with. So I crimp my uh, cover crop, and so it's laying there. And I start to have weeds come through, like you see here. And so this area above the black line has been mowed. It's been mowed about two or three times with a mower. And this is uh, oh, about two. I set the mower about two and a half inches off. You can lower it a little bit more than that if you want to. Uh, this is about three weeks after I mowed the last time. So it gives you about three weeks, then you have to go do something. In three weeks, you have to go do something. This area in front of it I had the cover on it. And that's eight weeks right there with the cover. So I would not do this with all my vegetable crops, of course, but I, I think I would do it with tomatoes. Tomatoes are kind of sensitive to competition with weeds. Uh, peppers are too. So I'd want the Again, and my peppers and my tomatoes look uh, very good here, especially the tomatoes. Okay, and this is sort of the same thing. This is a different weed coming up. This is a broadleaf weed, a pain that I have. This is one of the things I fight. Same area, the only difference, this had the uh, cover on it. This did not have a cover on it. This was mowed. This had the cover on it. You can see there's no germination of these weeds at that point. And that's because of a stale seed bed. There was some germination. I covered it up. Those weeds died. And so as long as you don't disturb the ground greatly, and when I just say disturb the ground greatly, I have my workers w walking on this all the time. It's, that's not enough to disturb the ground. So it's OK. And you can see some of it over here. You can see the same freaking weed over here, but not inside where the cover was. So it's another step. So you have to do the, the crimping rolling you cannot rely on by itself. I'll tell you that right now, I'll be honest with you. You cannot rely on it. You will not get this kind of mulch cover after a month. You will the first week, two weeks, maybe three, but then the weeds will start coming through. 
Sure. Have you done what you would consider a good stand and a good timing on the rolling crimping? Have you used, seen, or thought about putting down straw or using a straw blower to get another layer down? Yeah, and, and that could work. And that would, I think it would work very similar to the cover. So if you want to do that, I think that was great. I didn't do it just because it, it seemed like a lot more work, but I, I don't know how much more work or less work it would be than putting down the cover. The cover for me was easy. Yeah, I, like that. I just go out there uh, with the roll. I do it myself. I unroll it because I want to see how much time and effort it took. And then I just pin it in. It depends on how your farm is laid out. Are they long rows or are they all very short little rows? Then you have to cut the, the lengths up and then it becomes a little more of a pain. But if you're only doing it with certain crops like tomatoes or peppers, then like I said, uh, the covers will last, if you're careful with them, at least five, seven, eight years. So your investment in that is well paid for. But if you have a, a, a problem with the weed, and we have a problem with this curly dock, uh, the cover does a real good job. OK. So crimping and rolling is usually not enough to have good weed control throughout the season. Weed buried does not have to sit very long, it's just one to two weeks. Uh, one week if it's real dry and hot, that's enough. Two weeks if it's rainy, and it'll work just as well. And that creates that stale seed bed. Okay, once removed, the weed barrier provides two to three months of good weed control if there is a cover crop mulch layer present. I only put that in. You've got to have the, mulch, the cover crop mulch crimped. If you do it just with bare ground, like I said here, it lasts only about four to six weeks if you're lucky. If it's dry, it lasts a lot longer. If it's wet, it doesn't last as long. Yeah? Just the other alternative, which is what we've done in our heirloom tomatoes, is you pick the, the best, the most expensive seeds, and the most important tomatoes to you, and you just put the plastic landscape fabric on them in the pathway, and you leave it there all, all season long. You can afford to buy the landscape fabric, just put it down. You're not scooching it all summer long, you're just leaving it there. And we didn't do any kind of, you know, roller crimping. Or right. Mode, put the landscape fabric down. That, that's fine. There. That's fine. E either way. This is just so you don't have to have a ton of fabric. You can have some, right. and then if you move it around, Absolutely. you can put it wherever you want it to help you out. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think the wheat bear is too laborious for one person. Uh, you get uh, good weed control depending on the amount of rainfall. I'm not going to read all this. Now, this one, my early no-till yields of tomatoes when I started working on this about four or five years ago were 30 to 40 percent lower than the till or the black plastic areas that I had, okay? But later yields are anywhere from minus five to five percent greater than the tilled or the black plastic areas. So just a question though, in your system, when you're tilling that row of the tomatoes, are you then Hoeing for in-row control, what are you doing for the actual, that band that you're, t you're actually tilling? Uh, the band we'll, we'll use, I don't need to do that. I don't need to till at all. I'll put the cover right up against the, 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 the plant. Yeah. So this is a tomato, I'll put the cover right up next to it. Okay. And so that, a lot of times there ought to be weeds or something germinated in that little area. And when I cover it up, it just becomes mulch. So it, this is like anything else. Once you start working with it, at first this is a disaster, and I think a lot of people just give up. And, and if you're trying to make a living from it, I understand, you just can't experiment like I can. And, but if you keep at it, you find out what works for your system, and then your yields are going to start coming up. So the average yield is the same, basically. It's zero. There's no difference between tilled or black plastic tomatoes. Uh, the quality is usually better and lasts longer. The, I get better quality tomatoes longer into the season on uh, my uh, no-till than I do in my black plastic. The black plastic just seems to really push the tomatoes and it just wears them out real quick. Okay, any questions about no-tilling? Yes? Oh, this is such a basic question. I'm embarrassed. That's all right. So for those of us that have to plant in many 
of our fields or portions of our fields in raised bed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to make the conversion so I can reduce tillage to permanent raised beds. Uh, Anything to say on that? Raised beds. You should be able to work it the same because you're, you're going to work the cover crop. You probably have to crimp it along with the, 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 the you can't how go. Do you crimp, how do you crimp the path and the raised bed and the path and the raised bed? And the well, I probably would put it on top of the raised bed, the crimper, and then go that way and then put it as best I could in between. You're probably going to have it a little lopsided unless you have a lot of space between your beds. So it's going to come like this, and it's going to miss some of that crimping and rolling, some of your stuff. So in other words, you have to have a bed, however wide your crimper is, and then another bed, right. and then so forth. Which is more space for weeds, because there's Right. So the, if you have permanent beds, it's going to be a little more difficult. We don't yet. We're just trying to move toward that. So I want to move toward no-till, but we are in raised beds. Uh, that, that, that's where the, the cover crop would come in nicely, I mean the, the cover fabric, because uh, you're, some of it won't crimp, so it'll sort of crimp like that and stay alive. But if you put the cover over it, it's going to dry and die. Yeah. So you'd have to depend on that a little bit more until you worked out another system. Or straw, if you wanted to, as the gentleman suggested, using straw as another cover. Uh, there is one that you, can, you, you can use a biodegradable. I would not use it as a cover, as a weed barrier, because it won't allow uh, water to penetrate. I mean, I guess I'm thinking in row, like for, your, for her crop, if she had trouble getting the raised bed part, but could do the walkway. What would you want to, you, you want to put the, the... I'm saying like she could, she could build, she could take a uh, two by six, drill two holes in with a rope, crimp down her, her cover crop, and it's laid down and it didn't kill it, she could then cover that biodegradable plastic over top of her print. Uh, I see. To cover it, and then she could do whatever she wanted in the walkways, whether it's landscape fabric or, or straw or plastic. I see. You don't, you don't use plastic, do you? We do do plastic. Okay, then. Uh, we make raised beds, which is, you know, bringing up the soil, moving the soil, we put plastic on them. I, I tried laying that down, as he said, as best you could. Uh, I, I'll show you another method here. Uh, one other method. I'm going to go through. This is uh, work by, done by Saruti Hook. Are you, you giving me uh, the finger? No, no. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can talk as long as you want. It's the end of the day, so I'm there. You're good. <laughs> as long as you're engaged, I'm fine. This is uh, Saruti and his technician, oops, oops, uh, Gui Chen, Dr. Gui Chen, have been working on strip tillage work. And uh, they have problems with no tillage, some of the same things I talked about. So, and he, he brings up that no till alone for weed suppression is challenging. So he's being kind. Uh, it's difficult. Okay, reduced yield and delayed harvest. That often happens with the, the no till. And I've had that, but it, uh, over the years I've gotten around that. The tomatoes seem to do better over time as you do this. And I think it's just because I understand what's going on in my system a little bit better. So these are some of the problems growers have with no-till. Compaction, need to release N. And that's one thing, you will release N from that cover crop that's laying on top of your soil. It will go down. It will decay. It just will do it slowly. But I do have uh, good nitrogen. So strip tillage overcomes some of the constraints of no-till. And that's what this is all about. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. But he, he does a crimp and roll. His a roller crimper isn't as pretty as mine. His is yellow. And so he crimps and rolls his. He started out doing this, but he didn't like it after a while. And I'll show you what he's done. This is uh, what we did primitively. And so he crimped and rolled this. And then he took the tines off of everything except one area. And he, this is his strip till. And you see it's kind of wide. So this is what we did early on. It was a pain in the butt because you had all the weeds start coming in here so the, and, until that grew up enough and it never was enough. And then you can uh, go ahead and transplant into that strip till area. As time has gone on, of course equipment, and that's the big thing, when equipment comes along it's a lot nicer, 
And so these are heavy duty discs that are cut through it. And then these wheels actually uh, mix up the soil as it comes through. So you get a nice little strip tilled area. And you see the strip till area in this crimson clover. So he's prepared the strip till area a little bit earlier. And you see that they still don't have any weeds in them. So he's going to get ready to plant into that. Now, some of this stuff is just crazy. And so he, he's, he doesn't kill this. He just lets it. It's a live mulch. And so I would not suggest you do that, OK? That has not been real successful. Uh, you can also plant seed directly into it. This is a no-till plant, seed planter. And so here, going through the uh, uh, rye, this is being no-tilled directly into it. And this has been strip-tilled first and then planting into it, seed. And that's what it looks like up close. So you get a nice little preparation of a seed bed in that little strip. Then hopefully you can kill the rye. So this is his research objective. He's looking at weed density and biomass, the time spent hand weeding, and then finally the crop yield. So he looked at bare ground, black plastic mulch, no-till, and strip-till. He had crimson clover drilled at four pounds an acre with rye drilled at 60 or 40 pounds. Okay. And he looked at inter and intra row of weeds, weed removal. These are his pictures, not mine. OK, two areas in each plot remain weedy so he could see how much it affected yield. And then the fruit was picked and weighed. And don't ask me why, but he, he picked uh, eggplant to look at instead of some of the others. So the, here's his crimson and uh, the rye. It's very pretty. But he waits until the, they've got seed heads on it, and he waits until it's, got, it's flowering. So he waits until that time. But he's gone, uh, gone away from uh, crimping and rolling. He doesn't like that. He's gone to this. And this is a mower. And what this, this type of mower does is take the stalks and chops it into little bits. That's a flail mower. Yes. Yeah, very good. It's a flail mower. He likes this because it, you can flail mow at any time. You do not have to wait until a certain time that the grass or the cover crop is ready to be crimped and rolled. You can see here he's crimped and rolled the areas between his plots, but he's flail mowing within the plot. And it does get a nice surface uh, to plant into. And I'll turn to the flail mower if he's getting kind of late and my stuff just isn't ready yet to crimp and roll. So I'll, I'll just flail mow it. The problem with it is this stuff breaks down really fast because the, the clover supplies the nitrogen to the, uh, the soil bacteria, and they break down the grass really rapidly. No, because when I showed you the rye, remember way back when, the weeds were coming through the rye. You need that legume, it seems like, to fill in those spaces. Even flat. Oh, no, not flailing. Flailing is fine. You could go with probably all rye and make it last a little longer. He needed this for the nitrogen. He needed the nitrogen for his crop. And so these are different pictures over time, different places. This is a no-till. You can see it's not real heavy cover. It's already started really breaking down. This is a black plastic mulch. This is the strip till. And what do you see in the strip till area? Yeah, a lot of weeds. And that's what happens a lot of times. And this is bare ground. OK. So this is the weed biomass. And you see the no-till did very well, relatively speaking, with keeping the weed biomass down. Black plastic did too. Strip till did not, and of course the bare ground did not. So these two are the best, keeping the weeds down, weed biomass down. The strip till and the bare ground, not much difference. Uh, in 2014, uh, probably a little bit heavier rain uh, during this period. No till, a little more weeds. Black plastic, of course, did real well. Bare ground and strip till did not do so well. But we'll, we'll look at the yields then. 
So now timing. How much time did it take? And you see, the only one that's really different is the black plastic, just because you don't have as much area to, to till. And so these all took about the same time to go in and till. The strip till actually took longer uh, than the others, just slightly. And that's because it grew up right where the plant was and you had to carefully go in and cultivate around those plants and that took extra time compared to the no-till or the bare ground. All right, these are yields. And you can, so you can see that the no-till did not do as well as the others. So even though there's a lot of weeds in the strip till, it still did better than the no-till. And I think this is cooler soil. Uh, it set the plants back a little bit. This was in 2012. In this 2014 experiment, the yields are about the same. They're less than they were in 2012. I'm not sure what reason. Uh, one of the things I think is happening here, and you'll see this when people work no-till, is that year after year, their yields get better and better because they're working with the no-till system. And they start to understand it, what seems to work, what doesn't work for me, and so you adjust it. And so your yields start to come up because of that. Okay? Oh, so, so some of his summaries. Bare ground, no cultivation at the plant. No, those were the worst. High weed density in crop rows of strip till plots. Lower weed density and no till, I'm glad to see. Overall black plastic. Plant growth was slower in no till in 2012, but not in 2014. Again, the more you work with the no till, the more you're going to feel comfortable with it, the better your crop is going to be. The quality of the eggplant was better in the strip till plots. I'm not sure why that is. <clears throat> and a conservation tillage required less machinery input, according to Serenity. Okay. So cover crop residue pr provides weed suppression is not enough for full season and control, and I agree with that 100%. You're going to need something else. I don't, whatever it is you want, if you cover that area up, don't disturb the ground. You can only need it covered up for another week or two, and then you can remove that if you want. Okay. That's it.